Hey everyone, uh, we are so glad that you are joining us today. Hey, before we get started, we just invite you to do a few things that'll help you stay in the loop and up to date with what's going on here at Heartland. So number one, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and also make sure you click the bell because that'll actually give you the alerts when we're going live. Number two, make sure you follow us on Instagram as well as Facebook. And certainly last but not least, make sure you download the Heartland CC app so you can stay connected to everything Heartland. We had an awesome time yesterday, right, Sharman? Absolutely. Uh, getting to join with so many of you guys and, and worship together. Now, don't forget to sign up for Midweek Communion starting uh, September 24th, this Thursday. We are so excited to see so many of you guys as we take steps towards reopening. As we head into our time together today, let's join the team in worship. There's nothing that a God can do, no Miracles on miracles on miracles, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one word. The darkness has to reach you. Yeah, yeah. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven, yeah. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe, yeah. There's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move, yeah. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do, yeah. Listen, just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. That's good. Uh, just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, I feel the power of hell. why I believe in him. He's my firm foundation. Yeah, listen, listen. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Hey, let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Sing it out. I will believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no power
next Sunday, September 27th at 6.30 p.m., we are hosting an online all-family uh, Heartland Advance meeting. We're going to talk about where we've been as a church and where we are going. We invite you to be a part of this as we talk a vision, um, as you have an opportunity to ask questions, and we'll, we'll share with you how you can get involved with Advance and help Heartland advance God's kingdom in our community and beyond. You can register at the heartland.cc website, and we'll send you an email with a link to the live stream. We are so grateful for your continued generosity in this season. Because of your giving, it allows us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. So in this season, we just want to continue to bless others. We want to continue to be the church, not just the building, but the hands and feet of Jesus working in our community. So we invite you to give generously and joyfully. We have three ways that you can give. You can text Heartland CC to the number 77977 to give via text. You can download the Heartland CC app and download there for a quick, safe, and convenient way to give electronically. Or you can go to heartland.cc slash giving to give online. Last week, we kicked off our brand new series, Before I Die. And it was such a blessing seeing you guys post like all of your bucket lists on the bucket. Wait, why would you put a list on? Um, anyway. bucket list. <laughs> but hopefully you guys get a chance to accomplish those things before you kick it. Remember? Anyway, okay. whatever. So today, Steve Carter continues our series, Before I Die. Check it out. Heartland, Steve Carter here, and we are in week two of this series, Before I Die. Today, I want to take you to the book of Acts, to a city you've probably never heard of, to a city that my favorite college, the University of Michigan, has actually led the kind of um, digging and unpacking and learning so much about a city called Pisidian Antioch. But before that, I do that, have you ever watch the show Friday Night Lights. I, I love it. I mean, I, I love football. I love high school football. But if you go into Texas, there are cities that maybe have 40,000 people that live in the entire city, but then you get to this arena where they play high school football, and this stadium seats somewhere like 65,000 people. There's more seats in the city in the, in the stadium than there are people who actually live in the city. I've always been so fascinated by that. But here's the thing. When you get to the city in Pisidian Antioch, the story goes that, that Paul is, is on this like trip and, and he finds himself going to the city and one day, probably like you and I, and maybe for some of you just kind of tuning in or, or showing up for the first time at Heartland at home and, and you're, you're sitting there and you're just kind of walking in and, and, and Paul walks into this synagogue. Now, synagogue probably it was no bigger than 70 or 80 people in this time. And he's sitting in there, and, he, and he's just kind of going through the motions. And I bet by the clothes he was wearing, I bet from the greeter that someone could recognize he's not from around here. Maybe he had a little bit of an accent, but they realized, man, this guy's a little bit different. And I bet someone started asking questions like, where are you from? And he probably started to go through his pedigree like we see in different parts of the New Testament. And I bet someone was like, oh my goodness, you studied with the Rabbi Gamaliel? You're like, you're like Paul? We've heard about you. We've heard about you. And I bet that person who was kind of greeting at the synagogue went and told someone so much so that the people break precedent and they literally, they literally ask Paul to get up and just share some opening remarks. I mean, it'd be like if we were gathering at Heartland and all of a sudden, you know, six, seven years ago, I was getting up to teach and then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Billy Graham. I mean, what, what do you do? You just say, hey, uh, Billy, do you, is there anything you'd like to say? Um, is there any, any words you would like to speak on behalf of our people? Any, any kind of encouragement you might want to give? But... They don't know who they're asking. And Paul gets up and Paul delivers a message. And I'm talking a message. And you can read it in Acts chapter 13. 
And he begins to just preach at these people. And he goes through the gospel. He goes through the history of the, the Hebrew nation. He unpacks the power and the beauty of grace and resurrection and Jesus. And it's so moving. Now, imagine this. You're Jewish. And you're sitting there watching this going, we just asked you to say a verse and maybe give a nice little prayer and some kind of pleasantry. And what are you doing? You're preaching. And you're not just preaching, you're preaching a different message than we are used to. And then something happens. He gets done, and look what it says in Acts 13, verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. So one week later, one week later, Paul is invited to stay in the city to come back and to deliver a message. It would be as if someone came and spoke here at Heartland and all the people were like, you can't leave right now. What you said was so intriguing, was so moving, was so beautiful. Please stay one more week. Please stay one more week. And if you stay one more week, we're gonna like tell some people about this. We need more people to hear this story about grace and resurrection. So Paul and Barnabas, and Barnabas is just the great encourager, he probably looks at Paul and goes, just stay, bro, just stay. This, God's probably in this. Let's just stay. Let's see what God's up to. And then look what it says. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. I love this. He's like walking, he's just like, hey, I'm gonna tell you about what grace is all about. Now, verse 44, one week later. And for the Hebrew people, Sabbath was on a Friday night. They did Friday through Saturday. So like sunset on a Friday through sunset on a Saturday. And so on the Sabbath, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. I mean, so you gotta think about this. Scholars will say that that city was probably between 35 and 50,000 people. And almost the entire city comes to hear Paul. And they all show up at the synagogue, and there's not enough seats in the synagogue. And I guarantee you, someone, because scholars will tell you that next to the synagogue was this amphitheater that sat some 20 plus thousand. I bet someone was like, I can get us into that. And I bet they open up this amphitheater and they begin to kind of fill this massive amphitheater and Paul begins to preach. And I sit here and I read this story and I go, they heard one man speak about grace and resurrection and they're like, give us one week and we're gonna tell all our friends. Give us one week because this is speaking to our actual reality. This is saying something that's speaking to our hearts and to our minds and we want every one of our friends to experience this. But you know what's amazing? Is sometimes people don't actually like when Jesus is stirring. And some people actually don't like when the kingdom is growing. Some people don't actually like when things are begin to advance and multiply in some exponential form of growth. Because if you look at it, it says this. In verse 45, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Now here's a group of people who could literally see, we've never had the entire city come out to hear a message. Maybe God could be in this. But here's the thing. For so many people, when things begin to change, when things begin to evolve, when God begins to stir, when transition begins to happen, the biggest question, and I remember sitting with Carly Fiorina. She ran for president in 2016. I sat with her and I asked her, and she used to be like the, the CEO of HP, Hewlett Packard. I sat with her and I asked her, when transition happens, what often goes through people's mind? And she said, it doesn't matter how spiritually deep you are. It doesn't matter how emotionally intelligent you are. The primary response to change that people ask is this, what does this mean for me? And that's what the Jews are asking. What does this mean for me? What does this mean for, for my leadership role? 
I was leading this thing and it was only 75 people. Now all of a sudden the entire city is coming to hear this guy named Paul and they get jealous. And I think sometimes when change happens, it becomes so easy for us to ask, what does this mean for me? I feel like I'm losing something. But the more beautiful thing to ask is, what might God be up to? Every time I find myself feeling threatened, I wanna ask that question, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for me? I have to stop and remind myself, no, 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 what might God be stirring? And that's what these people start to go. God is doing something. It became so apparent that all of our friends are here. A quick time out. Many of you are sitting in your living rooms right now and you took a bold, bold yes and opened up your living rooms to Heartland at Home. And it's COVID, I mean, it's changed. We, we're not able to meet all together. But can you imagine? Can you imagine if like all of a sudden we began to really take ownership of every street in Rockford and the surrounding cities? Can you imagine if every one of us said, you know what, every neighborhood matters to God, every house matters to God, so it's gonna matter to me, and I'm gonna be this house that opens up my life, that opens up my heart, and I'm gonna actually point people to Jesus. Who knows what God might do? Who knows? And not just the streets, and not just the neighborhoods and the houses, but what about the schools? I mean, every one of us has a school that our kids are going to, whether virtually on Zoom or whether, whether we were attending because uh, our kids graduated from that high school or that middle school. I tell you what though, every one of us has some connection to a local school. And what if every time we passed it, we just said, I wanna pray, I wanna pray. I think too often we're like, we just need prayer in schools, which, yeah, that'd be beautiful, but you know what I think? I think we need more saints who are praying over schools and for schools. And I just go, man, can you imagine if we were like, every street matters, every house matters, every neighborhood matters, every school matters. And all of a sudden we said, I want what happened in Pisidian Antioch to happen here in Rockford. You know what I dream about? I dream about the first days when all this COVID stuff is done and we get to open up these doors. I'm thinking, man, we didn't have six days, but man, we might have a couple months. And we said, you know what we wanna do? We wanna, because of what we were able to do on the streets, in the houses, in the neighborhoods, around the schools, for our city, I imagine how beautiful that would be the first service that the doors open and there's way too many people. And I imagine how awesome that would be if like someone was like, hey, I, I, got, I got the keys to, to where, like, where Rockford's like hockey team plays. Okay, let's walk over there. And all of a sudden, it's just like thousands of people who could hear the message of grace and resurrection and Jesus. Before I die, you know what I want? I wanna see a city transformed. Before I die, I wanna see the renewal of Jesus. I wanna see the kingdom invade earth. I wanna see people who are fired up about their streets, about their houses, about their neighborhoods, about their schools, and about their city. This is more than just a message. This is a vision for how the heaven can invade earth. And I'll tell you what, if you look at Paul's life, he had a profound vision. And his vision was, every decision I make will lead me to Rome. He wanted to go right to where power was. And he really believed, if I can affect Rome, I could change the world. And every city was an opportunity. I mean, you look at Philippians, that's a Roman outpost. He went to all these outposts because he kept going, if I could win this, and I can win this, I can win this, I can get to Rome, I could speak to Caesar. He had a vision. And when you open up this book, I've realized something. The people who live a life of profound legacy, who live so connected to Christ, there's some similarities. So right now, I wanna tell you about three ways that we can see Pisidian Antioch happen here. And I believe that Paul understood this because he recognized it starts with the great commandment. The great commandment, we know, love God, love your neighbor. And when we love God, and you've heard me teach this about keeping the remain thing the main thing, when we find our 
value, our identity in our relationship with God, then we have something to give away. We have something to give away when we love our neighbor. But it wasn't just the great commandment. Paul had oriented his entire life around the Great Commission. And this was in Matthew 28 when, when Jesus basically tells these disciples, and some of them even doubted. If you read Matthew 28, some of them doubted this. But Jesus says, hey, I want you to go into the world and make disciples. Make students, make apprentices of me. And that's what Paul did. Paul didn't just stay in kind of his little neck of the woods. He was going out reaching people, engaging with people, because he really believed if people had grace as their primary engine and motivator for their hearts and their minds, their lives would be radically different. But it wasn't just the Great Commandment, and it wasn't just the Great Commission. Paul also understood what Jesus talked about in John 17, which is this great collaboration, recognizing that we all have gifts. We all gotta work to being united together. And for Paul, he was like, I'm a builder. I'm a teacher. I'm a leader. And he understood his gifts. And he traveled with Barnabas. And Barnabas' main gift was encouragement. And, and when you have that gift of encouragement, that means you speak courage into that other person. And I bet Barnabas was looking at Paul as he sat in that little synagogue, probably tapped him on the back and goes, you got this. Go get him. And friends, some of you have the gift of hospitality. Some of you have the gift of mercy. Some of you have the gift of administration. Some of you have the gift of teaching. And when we actually have this deep relationship because we understand the great commandment, love God, love our neighbors, we understand the great commission. Man, we want to actually make disciples and we understand our gifts. And can you imagine all of Heartland recognizing their gifts, having this deep love for, for Christ and their city? How could things not change? How can renewal not happen? How could heaven not just be so evident and present here? I was 19 years old, and on my 19th birthday, I gotta baptize my dad. And he comes out of the water. He really has the sense that God is calling him to leave Southern California and to move to Grand Rapids. He's a business guy. He sells out of his company, and, and I pressed him on it a little bit. He said, I felt like God told me I needed to go restore a relationship with my folks. He sells everything. We moved to Grand Rapids, and I don't know anybody outside of my grandparents, really, in Michigan. And I hear, I hear about some church. They're meeting in a homeschool building, which doesn't make sense to me, um, but they had a building. And all of a sudden, I show up to this church, and there's a fire marshal. And they said, there's too many people there. I said, what? I can't get into church? Sorry, too many people. Next weekend, I show up. A few minutes late, like 19-year-olds often do. And they're like, fire marshal, too many people. The third week, I had to sneak into church. And I snuck in. I had to sit on the floor. And I watched thousands of people opening up God's word and going, and leaning in, and I just realized, like, this is gonna change this city of Grand Rapids. I've seen it. I've seen thousands of people being baptized. I've seen thousands of people get engaged in trying to, to work and serve and love. I've seen justice and reconciliation happen. I've seen the gospel preached. I've seen lives transformed. I've seen miracles happen, and this is what Paul was all about. And can you imagine if it happened here? I'll be honest, I'll play all my cards right now. Before I die, I wanna see Pisidian Antioch happen here in Rockford. I wanna see a whole bunch of people who are fired up around the great commandment, love God, love their neighbor, but people who are so fired up, hot, fired up with this white hot vision to make disciples. And people who understand their gifts and want to use those gifts to reach their streets, to reach the homes, to reach their neighborhood, to reach the schools, to reach the city. And I dream of a day when sometime we can open up Heartland and all of a sudden there's a fire marshal standing outside going, sorry guys, there's too many people. 
too many people. Because we didn't use this time and sit idly, just kind of shaking our heads and unsure. But we recognize we're not going to make excuses. We're going to make moves and make moves around the great commandment, the great commission, the great collaboration, because we love our city. And because we want to see Pisidian Antioch happen again here in Rockford. Friends, I believe it can happen. Will you join us? Will you join us? And I believe if we do this, we're gonna be able to see God move in a mighty and powerful way. Before I die, I wanna see a city renewed once again. Let's pray. God, thank you for what you are doing here at Heartland. I imagine that there are people in their homes right now sitting and they've got friends that they've invited, people in their small group. They all have gifts. And these Harlan at home gatherings are so important. And there are other people who are tuning in, watching from their kitchen and from their living room. And God, I pray that you would remind them the great commandment, the great commission, the great collaboration. We can never do this relationship with you on our own. We need other people. And what's so amazing is that you consistently give people a vision for what their city can be. And God, I'm praying that. I'm praying that all of Heartland would just kind of say, man, how can we reach our city? How, how can we see what you want to do, God, in this city? How can a Pisidian Antioch story happen again here in Rockford? So God, I pray, I pray, I pray that you would bless my friends, keep them. Make us pe people who want to live by the great commandment, the great com commission, and to live with a collaborative heart, a collaborative spirit to bring our gifts for the betterment of the city. We love you, God. It's your name we pray, amen. prosper when the darkness falls it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph oh my God will never fail yeah my God will never fail oh, I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord
We're so glad that you joined us today. And hey, don't forget to register on the heartland.cc website for the all-family online advanced meeting that's happening next Sunday, September 27th at 6.30 p.m. And listen, next week, Eric will be teaching us part three of his series, Before I Die. So we'll see you there.